Welcome to the Erie Music History Podcast. I'm Chip Shell, your host. And today we have a special show because not only are we, we recording in a new location, I have two guests instead of one. Brothers Walt Slavinsky and Ron Guzik, welcome to the podcast, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Now, both of you have had a huge impact on the Erie music scene over the years. Walt, you played in the Fabulous Epics, Orange Colored Sky, and then with your own recording studio, Honey Bear. And Ron, you played in bands like Applesauce and The Cows. And I know that that's a super broad summary of everything that you guys have done. Um, But today we're going to focus on Walt. And Ron is going to add sort of color commentary since you're in town from California, right? Exactly. All right. Perfect. All right. And Walt, I apologize right off the bat because I know you've been asked a lot of these questions over the years. Um, A lot of folks have probably heard the stories, read the articles, um, specifically about the epics and how you guys met the Beatles after the Ed Sullivan show in 1964. Um, But there are some folks that are out there that may not know all the stories. So I I wanted to start at the very beginning. Um, Tell me, first of all, before you even joined the epics... Are you in high school? Are you? Do you, did you go to tech? Where'd you go? I went to a ca- I graduated from academy. Okay. In 1955. All right. All right. Yeah, well, that was before I was with any band, but I was playing in Erie. Uh, way back at the beginning, I had a couple of radio shows. Hmm. Uh, Breakfast at the Lawrence. And At the Lawrence Car- Hotel? Yeah. Oh, okay. And uh, a program called Coffee Encores on the pipe organ at the Warner Theater. And were these radio shows? Yes. What what channel was this on? WLAU. Okay, wow. And so were you in high school then? Uh, no, I had graduated. Okay. Incidentally, Warner Theater is bringing a pipe organ back. This year. Oh, so they haven't had one. Right. And they're having Not a concert. Lately. They, they took it out. Uh, years ago? Yeah, years ago. So you would play the pipe organ at the Warner live on the radio? Yes. Wow. Well, no, it wasn't live. We recorded it. Okay. And then they played it at 6, 6 p.m. Okay. Every day. So you, you've you graduated high school. You didn't go to college? I have studied... Uh, the system at uh, that's taught at Juilliard. Oh, okay, all right. So I had college level uh, education in music. Always a music guy. Always a keyboard guy. Yeah, yeah. I started at ten years old. I was playing the accordion. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, was a, I was a house full of polkas. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I did have a, I did have a polka band for a while. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, you have brothers that were musically inclined. Was there a lot of music in the house growing up? Yes. Yeah. Our mom played. My brothers. My mother played the piano. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, my father, who I didn't know very well, but he played accordion. Okay. My grandfather played fiddle. So, lots so, of music. Uh, you know, you know, we were a music family. Yeah. A very fascinating story in Erie, and I don't want to embarrass you all. Walt was playing a really rough nightclub accordion. I forgot the name of it. I think it was where now the Irish band is on State Street. And there was a fight, and a guy was hit, and he flew through the picture window in front and were laying on the sidewalk outside. Wow. And until the ambulance came, Walt went out to assist him, and I think he said a rosary for him too or something. Oh, that was a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I remember that story. It, it left an impact on So it. that was, you're playing accordion in a band. That's what I was going to ask you. I mean, were you playing in bands oh, post yeah. high school? There was a place called Mickey's Thirst Parlor. Mickey's Thirst Parlor. I love the name. On 3rd uh, or 4th and State. And I used to back up the uh, floor shows oh. on the accordion. <laughs> <laughs> With a band. Okay. Wow. I was 18 then. Okay. In the Musicians Union, I'm sure. Yeah. Back then. Oh, yeah. Right? I still am. Yep. Okay. A lifetime member. All right. And then 
where do you go from there? Where do you, what's the next step for Walt as a musician? Um, well, from there, I took, I got interested in um, piano and uh, organ and uh, I was playing in a place called Mike's Hideaway or Danny's, Danny's Hideaway. Danny's Hideaway. Danny's Hideaway. Sure, right. And um, and you're playing accordion. B three. No. Oh, no. now you're playing the B three. Right. Okay. All right. And I I, I had uh, the B three and I had a drummer playing drums. Okay. So. Um, uh, we had fun down there, and uh, that's where I met the guys from the Epics. Okay. And are they, did you know them already? I mean. No. No? No, I had uh, no idea who they were. And they, someone told them to come in and listen to what I was doing. And you were playing uh, the B3, you have a drummer, and you're singing, or is it just background music? Uh no, we were the feature. Oh, you were the feature. And also, and to interject, Walt and I both have an unknown hero to most people. Yeah. A man called Wild Bill Davis. Okay. Now, this guy probably introduced the Hammond organ, getting it out of the gospel churches into pop music. Okay. In fact, he arranged for Duke Ellington, April in Paris. Oh, wow. And used to tour with Duke Ellington and do his, his solo act. Yeah. And Walt and I were a big fan of his Walt song live, uh, but Walt was doing Wild Bill Davis type organ, which is thrilling. Okay, it's full fat chords screaming. Yeah, big block chords, you know, and yeah, uh, playing the actually the uh, uh, early music, you know, the forties and fifties. Sure. So. Um, so the guys, the guys talked to me, and they, they they liked what I was doing. So they asked me to join them, go to New York. Well, had they already formed? Oh, wait a minute, we, we, they didn't know about going to New York yet. Yeah, <laughs> we were, we were uh, playing locally then. And that's what I wondered. I know that I've read that you played at the Sons of Italy, or um, right. Yeah, was that the only place that I mean? So the first Calvary's of all, Club. So f tell me, first of all, are the epics formed when, I take it that Paul and Vinny come to see you, right? Yeah. Uh, have they already added the other guys? Yes, they had an organist, and they had a guitar player, Neil, Neil Myers. Okay. Gu guitar. Yep. And uh, Vince Hopkins? was Vince he? Hopson, bass. Okay. So they were already formed. And Larry Cope. Larry Cope was. Yes, one of the front men. The three front singers were Paul Yachlin, uh, um Vince Frizzini, and, and Larry uh, wasn't younger yet. <laughs> yeah, that's, what I, that's why I hesitated because I've seen. Lauren Cope, I've seen Larry Cope, yeah. I've seen Larry yeah. Younger. And Bugsy. And Bugsy, yeah, Bugsy, I have that yeah, too. Yeah. So those were all yeah. nicknames for him. Right. So um, Steve, was Steve on drums or did he um, come Ma later? Matchek? Yeah, I couldn't Matzak. pronounce his last name. Yeah, Matzak. He, he joined later. Okay. Did you have a drummer at first? Um, was there a I Paul Lane? I can't remember who the original drummer was. Okay. But no. anyway, um, I wasn't sure I wanted to join them. Okay. Uh, because I had a lot going on, you know, with the radio shows, and I had 65 students a week. Oh. So I was doing pretty good, and I... I didn't want to leave that. <laughs> you were te were you teaching at Osiki's or yeah, there? And I'd go to private homes. Okay, well, right. it was like the guy. Right, right. Yeah. I've heard. Yeah, right. So, so you had a good gig going, and they said, "Hey, come join this band." That you didn't know whether or not it was going to last or not. I never even heard them yet. Right at that point, and they hadn't played out yet, or. Oh, yeah, they've been playing around town. Oh, okay, gotcha. 
All right. Private clubs. And uh, we also then played, um, had a couple of dances and yep. stuff like that. Sure. So this is 62, probably around there. 61? More like 60 and 61. Okay. All right. Because 62 is in what we left for New York. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Um, I brought a, a disc here. All right. That has the whole history of how we got that job. Okay, great. And our songs that we recorded in New York. Very cool. All right. You got to tell them how you got that job at the Peppermint. Oh, That's that was one of my story. questions. Yeah, I mean, should we That's jump to that right now? Or how, first of all, just tell me how you guys decide to move to New York City. Well, the Peppermint Lounge, everybody in the world knew about that. Right. It was a famous place. You know, it was an honor to play there. Right. So, you know, everybody wanted to play there. Our manager, Ray Tubbs, and Paul wanted uh, uh, us to make a record, which we did locally. I don't remember the name of the studio. It was upstairs, but we're on West 8th Street. But okay. We, we made a record, and... They took that record in a little record player to New York and played it for the manager of the, of the Peppermint Lounge. Wow. The dancers were rehearsing at that time. It was maybe six different girls that danced their city. They were part of the act. Mm -hmm. uh, they set us up right in front of the stage where they were rehearsing. And we played that record. And the girls were listening to it. They loved it, and they they said, "Sam, you, you got to hire these guys." Were you all there? No, no. Only our manager Ray Tubbs and then and Paul, Paul. Okay. one of the lead singers. Gotcha. Sure. So he said, "Okay, I'll give you a week." So we started playing there, and everybody liked it. We got the job. So I mean, you're back in Erie. All the guys are back in Erie, and Paul comes back probably super excited and says, "We're moving to New York." Yeah. <laughs> wow. I mean, that had to be a culture shock. That was exciting. Yeah, I bet. So I told everybody that I was working for that I'd be back in a week because I didn't know any different at oh, that. Oh, yeah. But uh, after two weeks, they picked up our contract and we were there for three, three years. And were you all, where were you all living? Right in the hotel because oh. Peppermint Lounge was in the... Uh, Downstairs in that hotel. What was the hotel? Um, the Knickerbocker? Was it Knickerbocker? The Knickerbocker. Oh, okay. I didn't know on that. On 45th Street. Oh, okay. So the the gig came with rooms? Yes. Oh, okay. Great. That made it a lot easier than moving yeah. to New York cold. And it was downtown Manhattan. Yeah. I mean, what better place would you want to right. be? Right. Times Square. Right. Right. Wow. That, that song was that song, Twist and Shoutin'. Okay. Oh, yeah, that one record. Yeah. Doing the twist and shout. Do, 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 Here's what they do. Da, 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 da. That was the record that launched them to New York. Oh, okay. All right. So that's the one. And uh, I had to call Mr. Oseek and tell him, I'm sorry about it. I'm not coming back. <laughs> and all your other <laughs> students. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So you guys get that gig, and that was one of the things I was wondering about was, first of all, how old are you now at that, at that time, your early 20s? Uh, 24 when we left for New York. Okay. And are all the guys around the same age? Mostly younger. Most of them younger? No pun intended, younger. <laughs> 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 all right. Yeah, how did the younger name... I've seen like different um, time frames when that came in and out. I mean, was there any younger brothers at this point, or was it just the fabulous epics? We were in the beginning just the epics. Okay, Im important people, and in, in the, of course there were all kinds of celebrities there all every night. Right. The, the Beatles came in to see us. Uh, George was sick the, the first night. Right. So he came back. They brought them back the second night. And uh, people like that, you know, the engineers and uh, uh, people in the business that book you, you know, and, right. and that kind of thing. 
You have shown me some postcards he has of people saying, love you all, great guy. And so on. like one is Dionne Warwick. She used to come in the dressing room and they used to fool around on tunes, do tunes and stuff. I'm glad you said on tunes. Good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, yeah. and an incredible amount of people. Yeah. He was friends with uh, Jim Neighbors. I got to be buddies with Jim. Hmm. I mean, people always ask you about the Beatles, but people don't ask about Jim Neighbors. I know the, the Rolling Stones came to see you, the Animals, you know, other bands did too. What were some of those other ones that people wouldn't think, you wouldn't think, you know, people would say, oh, Dion Warwick went there? I didn't know that. Well, who yeah. are some of the other folks? Well, uh, um, we were just trying to think Mick of her name Jaggers. in the picture. Mick? Shelley Winters. Oh, Shelley Winters. <laughs> yeah. Sure. And what are you saying, Mick Jagger? Uh, Mick Jagger... And his band came in and sat in with us. I've heard of them. Yeah. yeah. Some of the guys yeah. were staying with some of the guys that became the um, Young Rascals. During, okay. Larry told me that on the night off, the Vanilla Fudge needed a gig because they were trying to get somewhere. And he put in a good word for them so they could pay the off night. Wow. Liberace came in. Wow. It was the place to be for everybody. The one that broke my heart, he said, Audrey Hepburn came in. Oh, okay. I've always loved Audrey Wow, Hepburn. yeah. Well, shut up, Walt. Were you <laughs> always doing the, should I call it a parody of the Beatles? Were you always doing that as one set? Well, I, uh, at that place. With, yeah. Uh, with, I guess that's where we left there after the three years. We continued that somewhat. You did. But uh, the thing is, while we were playing at the Peppermint Lounge, they started hiring us in other places on our day off. Yeah. Madison Square Gardens. We played there uh, uh, to 17,000 people. Yeah, you have a picture of that for me, right? Yeah, I do. And th was it just you guys, or were there other people on the bill? There were uh, famous people that I, I can't even remember. That's who, okay. Yeah. Who it was. Yeah. Well, JFK because was there. So, oh, that's, yeah, that's the that's one. That's the one that JFK went yeah, to at Madison guess, Square Garden. I guess you wouldn't want to forget that. <laughs> and you played Carnegie Hall, right? Yes, that's where I met uh, Shelley Winters. What were you playing there for? Was that a whole bunch of different bands, or was that just you guys? Well, were, you know, when you're playing uh, like in places like that, you're pretty excited, and I don't... I didn't pay much attention to what the main draw was. Gotcha, right. <laughs> I just wanted to do a good job. You focused on your job. <laughs> yeah, right, right. I mean, a guy from Erie, Pennsylvania, a bunch of guys from Erie, Pennsylvania, when you stepped into Carnegie Hall, it had to be, like, surreal. Yes. And then they were the first act of that nature to play Carnegie Hall. Okay, right. I just remember another place we do, and we played the Jack Parr Show. Right. Which was the first... Tonight, Tonight show. Late Show. Right. I was looking for that online last night to see if I could find a, a video of it, and I couldn't. Oh, there was some famous comedian came on after us. He okay. said, what was that, World War Three? <laughs> 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 so you do three years at the Peppermint Lounge, and what happens? Why did the band split, or why did you leave? Um, I was internal strife between players. I've been in bands before. I've heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. Really, I never noticed. Yeah. That, that usually happens. happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so... You... So it kind, of, it kind of split. Right. And uh, I went with Larry. Mm -hmm. um, and Neil. And Neil. Right. So Larry Parker and you and Neil. Not Larry Parker. Oh, not Larry... Cope. Larry... Uh, uh, Cole. Larry Cole. Bugsy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Bugsy. Larry Parker. Larry Parker was a bass player that joined later. Oh, later. Okay. Yeah, much later. Gotcha. Okay. So we became, uh, we went out west and Don Sorelli became our manager. So you didn't go back to Erie first. You went straight out west. They stopped in Erie and played the village. That's what I was wondering because yeah. I saw your they comment did. about that. Uh -huh. And you yeah. played the village as the younger brother? or something? No, Larry Younger and the... Epic. The epics. epics. Larry the, Younger and yeah, the Epics. Yeah, we were still the Epics at that time for okay. a little while. And but, Paul and Vinny and who was the other guy that went with them? Maybe Vince. Vince? They came home or where'd they go? Uh, Vince, our, our bass player, joined the Army. Oh, okay. So then we started picking up new musicians. Okay. But um, 
One thing I wanted to mention how we got the name uh, Younger Brothers. Yeah. Um, Warner Brothers gave us that name. They became interested in us when we did some recording. Okay. At Warner Brothers. So they became interested in you when you were still the Epics. Yes. At, at the, they, this happened at the Peppermint Lounge. At the Peppermint Lounge. Lounge. But they said, we want you to change their name to the Younger Brothers. Yes. Where, where'd that come from? I think record the, companies do that a lot. I know, yeah. I just didn't yeah, know if they told you, like, why. It's, like, well, actually, it seemed like two acts in one because we had the f- three front guys right, and featuring the epics. Oh, gotcha. So the musicians in the band were still epics. Gotcha. And we had this act called the Younger Brothers now. <laughs> I can see that causing strife. <laughs> <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Okay. Yeah. All right. So you guys, uh, the three of you, um, you, Neil, and Larry, move out to San Francisco? Uh, close to it. It's, it was a little f- further south where uh, Don Zirelli had a nightclub. So you start playing there as a three-piece, or did you pick up some other guys? Uh, well, let's see. We picked up um, a drummer, Smith, his name was. But uh, I played bass on the the organ pedals. <laughs> okay, gotcha. All right. Every time, you know, people are so, so interested in watching an organist play with the feet. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it has to be tough. Ray Manzarek not, did it in the bit. It, it never doors, failed. Too. Every time I was, saw someone looking at my feet, I would lose it. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> then I'd start thinking about it. Right. Because when you're playing organ. And, and you've got pedals down there. You don't even think about it. You just do it. Yeah. yeah if you think about it, you start flipping. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and right. so you guys as brothers, Ron, you're younger. Mm-hmm. Were you were playing keyboards right from the beginning too? Or were you one of those, um, I want to play guitar, but I want to do no, it. No, keyboards. My I, older, start, I started on okay. keyboards. So he influenced you. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. For sure. In a lot of ways. Right. And um, we had a Hammond at home, which was great. I okay. I was starting something chintzy. Right. So I, I organ and then I bought a piano and learned how to play piano and stuff and started getting I was interested in classical organ, but it was a whole lot more fun to play in bands. Gotcha. So I just did that. I mean back then those organs, a B three is a big instrument. And you probably had a Leslie with you or two of them. Yeah. I mean your roadies had to have hated you or else you had really good <laughs> friends. Right? I mean back then. Good friends. <laughs> I'll never forget that one club. It, 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 the steps were outside and it was like going up to the third floor because oh. the ceilings were high. Yeah. And they had to push that thing all the way up the steps. <laughs> that was horrible. I bet. Every keyboard player has back aches now. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> okay, so we're what? in San Francisco. You have started as Larry Younger in the Epics still? Yes. Okay. But um, let's see now. Then I started writing. And I wrote enough songs for an album. Okay. And someone from Universal liked the songs. How did they find out about the songs? Had you been shopping them around or? Uh, well, I think our manager, oh, manager. Ray, not Ray. Uh, Don Zarelli. Don Zarelli. Don Zarelli. Zarelli. Okay. He got uh, the, what do they call them? The, the guy that hires bands to record. Booking agent or? a an A and R guy, okay. Yeah, A and R guy. Okay, so this is 1968. You've just written all pretty much a whole album. Yeah. And Universal says, "We think you should change your name to Orange Colored Sky." That, that's right. Okay. All right. So, how'd you feel um, about that name? I liked it, you know, because that's what people were doing: Strawberry Alarm Clock right. and all those names. You know, <laughs> they were crazy. Right. Right. But. Um, the thing about that I was going to tell you is that while we were recording uh, my album, they asked me to come over to the movie department and uh, write a, a song for the movie that Don Knotts was... The Love uh, God. The star, The Love God. Yeah. Right? It was a parody on Hugh Hefner and yep. all that. that yeah. Thing. The Love God question mark. <laughs> right, right, yep. <laughs> I've seen some clips. I've seen the clip of you guys that are in the movie. Oh, yeah, we're, yeah. we're in the movie. I'm going to include that in the in the uh, episode notes yeah. for this, too. Now, now be, because it's a parody, the lyrics fit 
But Walter can't live down those lyrics. I sing them to him every time I turn around. Mr. Peacock, Mr. Peacock, no one else could be so groovy. You're the status quo. Free love forever, Mo. <laughs> Harry Rock and Rex have now become Brand X. He has sang those to you before, hasn't he? <laughs> I always tease him about it. So, yeah. I mean, you guys get that gig and you're in the movie. How was that working in Don Knotts's movie? Oh, that was thrill- thrilling. Yeah. It really was. Yeah. And after that, I was a fan of Don of Knotts. Yeah. Who were the girls that sang the song in the movie? Did you know that? The Blossoms. The Blossoms? That's what they were called. Okay. And uh, they did a nice job. I was going to say, d- were you happy with the outcome of how that song oh, came yes. about? Oh, yes. I think it's a great song, yeah. So, Mr. Peacock, you're, you're, you're in the film business now. Well. You were for a little while. <laughs> yeah, for a little while. But uh, actually, I'm writing film music right now. Oh. Uh, I'd like to get back into it. So I've got some things. You know, I brought one of uh, the uh, latest ones. So, Walt, you're 84, and you're still writing, still recording. You're still running your studio, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I can do everything I did before. Good for you. That's great. You should see him arm wrestle. <laughs> <laughs> so what happens then? Um, the The love God, and then, I mean... Really, Orange Colored Sky then kind of blows up. I mean, you guys start traveling all over with all sorts of famous people. Yeah, yeah. and uh, our manager, Don, knew how to uh, book things through agencies. He got us some, one of the biggest agencies. I can't remember right now what the, which one it was. But they booked us with... Um, Burt Backrack. Yeah. And we did 65 concerts with him. Wow. On the road. I never even knew where we were, what city we were in, because every day we were in a different one. <laughs> just in the U.S.? Did yes. You go overseas too? Or just... No. Um, we never did go overseas. How was he to work with? Great. Yeah? He really was. I mean, you talk about a songwriter. Oh, God. Yeah, oh, yeah. 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 What an interesting story. When this guy was playing, I believe it was in Washington, the JFK Center, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. My mom went down to see them. And in, and Walt introduced my mom to Burt Backrack in the dressing room. And my mom was a musician and, and uh, very uninhibited. Yeah. And she said, by the way, Bert, I love everything you write. But that one song, I don't think you were... Something was wrong with that. She was speaking of promises, promises. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and he's going, oh, I'm sorry. Do you have a better idea? Send it to me. <laughs> you know, I didn't mean to. Sorry. Yeah. You know? <laughs> She's <laughs> criticizing Bert Backrack. Right, right. Poor Walt's in the corner. <laughs> oh, my. <Mom. Yeah>, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so 65 dates on the road with Bert Backrack. That's a lot. I mean, that was a year. And, you know, he played in the best places. Oh. One one of them was Red Rocks. Oh, one of the best places. Yeah. Oh, that was great. I We'd bet. Hollywood Bowl. And, oh. uh, all kinds of places like that. Yeah. It was fun. I bet. I bet it was. And he was very good to us. Okay. Now, the other guys in the band. Uh, tell me who else is in the band now in Red, red or Orange Colored Sky. Well, you know, we had eleven. I counted them, 11 bass players, wow. different ones. I'm a bass player. I know how it goes. They came. They come and go. It's yeah, like the right. Spinal Tap drummer. That's right. <laughs> they just kept spontaneously combusting. Well, most of them always played too loud. I get that, too. <laughs> <laughs> but 11 bass players, that's a lot. Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm not even going to begin to remember all those names. And... You traveled all around, I, I know, uh, not only uh, Lake Tahoe, but um, didn't you go to some A lot other, of Nevada stuff. Yeah, I was going to say, and, some Vegas places. Yeah. Uh, we, we were on a, a tour of, like, for 14 years. We did the uh, Lake Tahoe, Reno, and Las Vegas. 14 years. Yeah. Wow. Always as orange-colored sky. Yes. Now, the best gig, though, for sky was Cincinnati. Cincinnati, oh, yeah. we could do no wrong. Walt would do Joy on the organ. 
Yeah. And he, it just bring the house down. Yeah. It was crazy. Some of the stuff. That was a fun gig. So they just really took to you guys in Cincinnati. Yes. We always had a thousand people in that in that nightclub. And in fourteen years, you still only have the one album, right? Uh, the Orange Color Sky no, album. When, uh, I just wrote some singles that they put. On. Okay, the forty fives. Yeah, yeah, like four of them, I think. Okay, um, what at what point are you playing with Frank Sinatra? Oh yeah, well, about the time that we were playing with Burt Blackrock. Okay, we toured with him, if not for a real long time, but uh, we were going around to different places. And it was there was a benefit involved that he was Metrioni or something like that. Mm. It was a policeman that was shot. Okay. And he was raising money for uh, the, the family. Right. So um, I guess maybe a, a week or two we were traveling with him as a warm up act. Okay. Did you meet him or? I, yes. Yeah. He was so great to us. Really. Good. Yeah, people wonder and they ask me, well, they, you know, they get your stories about him. And, but I'll tell you, he was very nice. Yeah. He, he came to our dressing room to make sure uh, we had everything we wanted. Also, a year later, we were playing at uh, in Hollywood at um, PJ's, and he saw the uh, promo, and he sent us a telegram. It said, Dear Gang, win it all. <laughs> So he he was really great, huh? And was, go ahead. In those days, another highlight Sky did. Don Zeroli was an incredibly likable guy. The manager, yeah, yeah. And, and he was a great cook. So he would make friends with his cooking skills as well as his personality. Okay. But one of his good buddies was Don Costa, who was a famous producer. Okay. He produced the, uh, well, um. Not the way we were, but uh, for Frank Sinatra and a lot of other, like Barbra Streisand, people like that. Gotcha. I remember when I was 17, very good year. He produced that. Okay. So, so Don Cox was a very big producer, and he produced a version. Uh, Jesus Christ Superstar was really popular then. Yeah. And he produced an Orange Colored Sky version of Simon Zealots from Superstar. Okay. That right. piece. And that was released, too. As a 45. Yeah, as a 45. Okay. right. And I'll tell you what happened. <laughs> All right. That's what we're here for. <laughs> we played a, um, uh, some special day for the Jewish people. Okay. And it was an outdoor thing. It was like a big picnic. The place was packed with people. And we, without thinking, started playing that song. And they came over right in the middle of it and stopped us. Oh, they did? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we just weren't thinking. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> oh, boy. It was, it was embarrassing. <laughs> it's memorable, <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Musicians. Yeah, I never that's forgot right. that. I bet. Yeah. But. How about, um, this is a weird one that I wanted to ask you about, but Chula Clark playing on the commercials with her, right? Yeah, that's right. that's right. Yeah, I mean, I've I've watched those commercials. I mean, she was great back then. And do you remember? I mean, is that you guys in that one commercial? I remember that some of the guys were in that from the group. Okay, I don't think I was. I think you were. Tony Berry was in there too. We we haven't mentioned the second singer in Orange Car with yep. Sky at first was Tony Berry. Okay, he was from England. He's okay. back in England now. Yep. Yeah, I was trying to think. Uh, what I thought I had that written down what that song was. It was like the theme for the Plymouth uh, that yeah. she had done. Yeah, she did a whole bunch of them, them. Um, yeah. but it was good. And at one, I was flipping through the YouTube videos, and all of a sudden I said, "Wait a minute, that must be those guys," <laughs> you know. And they'd see little close-ups here and there of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tony was in there in Hell. I remember seeing Hell on that. I thought you were too on a piano. I think you might have been. Yeah, you were on a piano. Yeah. You did a well, few at things. my age, you know, <laughs> it's hard to remember everything. I, I appreciate you uh, remembering what you have. Um, so what else? 14 years you play with the band. Did it break up? What happened? I, I keep asking those terrible questions. <laughs> well, it was uh, actually 20 years all, all, okay. all together that I was on the road with uh, the Epics or the Orange College Sky. Okay, all right. But after 20 years, you know, 
it started getting tiring. Yeah. So we did so much traveling. I it felt like I had enough. Yeah. I wanted to have a garden. Okay. Uh, and I wanted to have a recording studio. And while we were recording in MGM I was, and any of the others, I would watch what they were doing and how they did it. What kind of mics do they use? Yeah. To, uh, what kind of mixing boards and all this stuff. So I decided I was going to go back home and start a recording studio. Hmm. And then uh, I started picking up stuff even before I left the group and I was recording them. Oh, recording other people. Yeah, in fact, no, we were recording, recording the orange, orange colored sky. Oh, okay. Well, one, we took some time off and rented an A frame in the mountains in Tahoe. Okay. And Walt engineered an album with Sky. All right. It did, we never got released, but um, that was some great tunes on there. Where are those tunes? Walt has them. I have them. Yeah. I never I, released them. No. But, uh, you know, I should try and do something with them because no one's ever heard them. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be great. Some and of it, the tunes in the, or, the other Orange Colored Sky album became hits in Japan recently. Oh, really? Yes. A song I wrote. Yeah, uh, called uh, Orange Colored Sky. Yeah, so um, uh, this one reporter, and I still have the tape. She left a message on my answering machine. She said that um, the song was a hit in Japan. Just recently? No, this was back uh, in the seventies. Oh, okay, All right. And um, I didn't know anything about it. And then I was getting people calling from all over the world wanting to ask me personally for a copy of uh, one of the songs they liked. Right. That, that was interesting. I bet. I <laughs> bet. And that was more recent, the people yeah. calling. Oh, okay. So yeah, it stood well, the test of time. Yeah. Yeah, but imagine yeah. that you probably don't have many of those anymore just laying around for people. No. Right. So you moved no. back to Erie then to start Honey Bear? Yes. Why the name Honey Bear? <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice experience. <laughs> it's sweet. Yeah. I, I just felt like that was uh, a name that wasn't threatening or, you know, it, it, it wasn't like amalgamated seal or something. <laughs> the amalgamated seal studio probably wouldn't have lasted as long. You're right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It represented Walt's uh, spoken nature. Yeah. <laughs> and it's always been in the same spot? Yes. How long? And still is. Right. 42 years. 42 years. Yeah, we've been recording a lot of different people. And so I told you uh, when you got here, you know, I had posted that I was going to be interviewing you, and then a number of people came out saying, I recorded with Walt, I loved Walt, you know, this was great, this was great. But what struck me was the variety of people and the variety of music that I know that they played, you know, I mean, I've, I've seen some of this stuff. I mean, everything from heavy metal to hardcore country to whatever. I mean, was there rap? I was going to just ask you, <laughs> was there something that you were like, this isn't me. I don't have the chops for this or you really didn't care. Well, I let them do the thing. Yeah. I had, um, people coming in doing rap over the years, were there some that stood out that you really enjoyed? There were some really good ones. Yeah? No. I, I j just never cared for the um, anything that had violence in it, and that sort of thing. You sure, know. sure. There, they, there were some raps that uh, they did that were uh, religious. Mm -hmm. Sure. They were really nice. You have a breath of the there people he's little, recorded. Yeah. From gospel groups to guys that were... The Clontels, I think, were from the 50s in Erie. Yeah, uh, sure. And uh, you recorded them. What was your favorite person to record, Walt, over the 42 years? Uh, I think Dave Dinkins. Oh, okay. Dave, D Dave Dinkins? Dinkins. Dinkins? What was? Yeah. Country. Country? Okay. It wasn't me. He was yeah. really good. <laughs> really? Not me? What about the cows? <laughs> Have you ever heard of them? Yeah, well, what? <laughs> Not Dickie and Joey and me? What? <laughs> I did record the cows. Well, the cows were really good. Yeah. Wonderful group and a wonderful bunch of guys. Of course, um, <laughs> You're prejudiced. My yeah. brother is one of them. Right, right. <laughs> By the way, when Walt 
first moved back to Erie, he, he was also doing a duo around town, Adrian and Slavinsky. That's what I was going to ask you. Did you continue to play? So, Oh, yeah. We did that 16 years. W- what was the name of it? Um, Le Castro and Slavinsky. Le Cas- no, was it Adrian? Le Castro? Oh, well, at first it was Adrian. We went, we went back out on the road for two years. Okay. After the group split up and I had, I had not started the studio yet. Okay. And you went as a duo? As a duo. And we played uh, the finer dining rooms. Okay. Some nice hotels. A- Adrian? Yeah. Adrian Balavo. He played piano. Oh. And I played uh, organ and my mellotron and... And other big instruments. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hard to carry around things. Yeah, right. <laughs> so the two of you tour around for a while and... A couple of years? A couple of years. And then you come back and say... I'm doing the studio full time. Yes. Okay. Uh, then, during the course of those other years, I know obviously you sit in with the cows when they come in town, or you know you probably sit in with whoever. Were you in any other regular bands, acts during that time? No. No. Stuck to the studio. Uh-huh. Yeah. And you played with. That's Le when Castro. I had the uh, duo with Diane LeCastro. Oh, Diane LeCastro. Okay. Yes. So you were playing. Just with her around. Yes. Okay. But uh, then, you know, it's getting hard to carry heavy stuff, and I got to that point where I just wanted to record okay. <laughs> and write. <laughs> right, right. Were you, uh, when you would record other uh, bands, would they? Would some of them say, hey, could you play the keyboard for us, or could you play this part oh, for yeah. us? Oh, yeah. So you're on a number of those recordings. Yes. Okay. Yes, and... and uh, it was an advantage to, um, you know, being uh, an engineer that plays. Right. Because you you can understand them much easier, hmm. what yeah. they want, or yes. what direction to go in, and right. so forth. Before it was popular to be a producer, saying it in quotes, yeah. air quotes, Walt was producing a lot of guys around town. They'd come in with songs, and they'd just play acoustic guitar and well, I was thinking maybe like this or something, and he'd do everything else, and they'd have a full production. Gotcha. From his inspiration and influence with them. Right. Yeah, sometimes they'd write a lyric, and then they'd ask me to put the music to it. Hmm. Okay. So I, I would imagine it varied in what people would come to you with. Sometimes they'd say, I've got everything all planned. I'm ready to go. To, I've got an idea. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Some of it's really remarkable. I always tell friends of mine, you know, they say, how's Walt doing? Because he's still doing it, man. And he's hepper than half the cats I know a yeah. third of his age. You know, he'll do a rap thing or a, um, electronica, you know, dance music type thing. Wow. Okay. Or, a, you know, gorgeous lamenting ballad. Right. Full orchestra. Anything you can think of. You know, going, wow, you're really on top of everything. Sure. And not only just doing it, but doing it with a creative bend or something f- fresh within that idiom. Yep. Not yep. just replicating the idiom. Right, right. You know, and I'm always impressed with that. Wow, it's good. And you had left how long ago, Ron? We moved oh, to Iowa 74. Karen, um, you're on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. I, I traveled with Orange Cove at Sky, and uh, Karen and I wanted to go home and have a second child. Okay. And then we had two kids. And Sky called us and said, hey, we have a year in Tahoe. We'd like to use two keyboard players. It'd be great. And it was. And you had two kids here in Erie? Yeah. So oh, Karen okay. and I and the two kids went and moved to Tahoe. Okay. When that job was done and Sky was kind of just enough is enough kind of, uh, we had friends in Southern California. So we moved down there just to see what it was like. Sure. Never really adjusted. But we were there, figure six months or so, just see what it's like if anything can happen. And that one day Karen and I said, hey, let's go home for Christmas, kids. And the kids went, we are home. What are you talking about? But consequently, we said, well, this is home, whether we like it or not. Right. So we just come home to Erie whenever we can. Okay. All right. You know, and usually, Walt comes out and visits, and we'll go to the NAMM show. Yep. And then the Grammys. Okay. We both belong to the Grammys. That's what I wondered. How did you guys get to go to the Grammys? I've seen that you've gone. So. Um, you join, but you have to prove yourself to them, and it's all that high school kind of attitude I look at it as. Okay. But that's me. But, uh, but yeah, and we'd go to the Grammys. It was fun. It's a great day. Yeah. You know, you make a day of it. What was the last one that you went to? 
I don't remember what year, but the reason that you enter the, the academy is if you are doing something currently. They, you know, with all the stuff that I did in the past, they were not interested in that. Mm. They want to know what are you doing now? Right, right. And I just happened to put up one of my uh, clients that I had produced on uh, online. Okay. And that got me in. And thanks to my brother because, uh, you know, he spoke for me too. Okay. He was, he was already uh, with the Academy. Yeah, I was with the Academy for a while. Because, well, if you come out, you know, the Academy is, it's, you know, get you in. You have a resume like no other. Right. You know, so I'm talking to people in the Grammys saying, you know, I don't know what your issue is or whatever, but he has a resume way beyond half the people in the Grammys. <laughs> um, but at any rate, yeah, we had a lot of fun at the Grammys at different times, and the NAM show's a blast. Right, uh, right. Yeah, I was with the Academy five years. Okay. And it was nice. It yeah. was fun. And you said that you're still working on some... Music for film right now, currently. Oh, yes, absolutely. I just bought new software again. Was that a COVID project? Like you were stuck at home, so I might as well start writing no, more? Or no. Just been doing I, I've it? always been interested in classical music. Okay. And uh, it's, it seems easier for me to write classical music than any pop stuff. Okay, all right. And I, because I've loved it so much, uh, that's, that's all I want to do. All right. That's great. I remember in Sky when we had the two keyboard players with it was a Mellotron, then a Chamberlain, which was the better version of a Mellotron. Okay, right. the tapes playing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the Beatles used a Mellotron and right. a Chamberlain. And we had all the keyboard equipment and synth and stuff and seven voices. So we, we Walt and I like classical music, so we did a rock arrangement of Handel's Messiah, not just a chorus, but yeah, a whole thing. And it actually went over because in those days. With Godspell and Jesus Christ Superstar, was, you could do something that was a little religious sounding and get away sure, with it. Sure, right. And right. then we did an arrangement to Rhapsody in Blue. Okay. You know, so we were all over the board with yeah, the things yeah. we were doing, you know, uh, with a classical interest in Very keyboards cool. and stuff. It was fun. Yeah, and we, that piqued people's interest. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was you, something different. Well, you have uh, brought me a whole bunch of things to look at today, right? Oh, yes, I have a lot of pictures and... I was on the Walt so, Library. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got me some CDs hey, to listen this to. Is, I want you to hear this. All right, all right. So let's do this. Let's wrap up the podcast right here. And okay. um, let me say thank you to both of you. I'm honored to have you both on the podcast. I really appreciate you coming out today. I'm so glad you were in town, Ron, to be part of this. And, and you and I are going to talk, Ron, um, again uh, another time, hopefully, mm -hmm. um, with Dickie and whoever else. Yeah. And um, talk about the cows and the applesauce or whoever else. Walt, I can't say thank you enough. Um, appreciate it. We thank you, Chip, for yeah. having us. Thanks. I really appreciate it. It went very smooth. Good, good. Well, this is great. So for those of you out there listening, make sure that you hit that subscribe button. I'm going to post a bunch of the pictures that I'm about to look at and some of the links and other music so that you can hear in person what we've been talking about this whole episode. So again, uh, I'm Chip Shell, and I appreciate you listening to the Erie Music History Podcast. Thanks. Hey, that's it for this episode. I want to remind you to check out Jack Stevenson's Two Man Happy Hour podcast for all the info on who's playing where and when. You can go to twomanhappyhour.com and find out all that info. Also, a big thank you to the JPT Foundation, which is our sponsor. They not only have an awesome bingo hall on West 38th Street that has bingo four days a week, uh, you can rent that hall out for various functions. Check them out at jptfoundation.com. Also, give a listen to Chris and Julie Moore's Next to You radio program at WQLN, NPR 91.3 FM, and live streaming. And get out there and support live music. Hey, until next time, I'm Chip Shell. Thanks again for listening to the Erie Music History Podcast. Hey, if you're still there, here's my random free plug for a local business that I like. If you like Mexican food, food check out uh, Toreros on Upper Peach Street. My wife and I love their fajitas. It's always really good food and great service. Okay, see ya.